without any further ado, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me. And we're going to take a look at the 137th Psalm. Psalm 137, as we continue our, our series here in um, the Psalms. That's page 335 in the Gift Bible, if you were given a Gift Bible on the way in. 335. And first, before we read and pray, and then you take your seat, I think for the, the sake of us reading this and coming at it uh, in the right posture, I want you to envision with me um, just a multitude of, of Israelites, of God's covenant people in the Old Testament coming together and together singing or reciting the words that we're about to read. I don't want you to read this as something that, uh, that uh, is only to be had with a cup of coffee in your very personal, very private devotional time. This was something that was corporately taken up in God's people, amongst God's people, men, women, and children together lifted up. You'll see where even it falls in the scriptures in the, in the fifth book of the Psalms, and it's, it's book ended by just these, these psalms of praise and thanksgiving. And then there's this one, and we're going to see how it stands out a little bit, but I don't want you to think of this as some difficult passage that we look at alone. This is something that was read. And now I want you to envision in a New Testament setting the same psalm that we're about to read being read uh, around a, a dinner table or in the living room, mother, father, children, some friends maybe, and, and going over this together because this has a corporate aspect to it as well. I just don't want us to, to relegate it to some obscure little place in the Psalter that we can deal with or not deal with on our own. Okay, so remembering that, I want us to uh, remember that this, the psalm we're about to read is as much a part of the Psalter as the beautiful pastoral images of Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Same God inspired this psalm. Psalm 137. Verses 1 through 9. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to the foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all of your word. Thank you for those passages, those texts that are what appear to be low-hanging fruit where we can just delight in them, even on their surface and we can see uh, very plainly uh, the loving nature of your heart. And I thank you that we get to read passages like this one. Difficult, perhaps. Shocking, maybe. Get to read them in the light of all of the scriptures and through the lens of the entirety of your word. And we can come to see even deeper depths of your virtues. That yes, while you are loving, you are, you are holy and you are just, and you are mighty, and you are not to be trifled with. Help us, Lord, to know you in all these ways, for all that we can know about you will transform us. And we pray that it would transform us and conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, through your Word. 
We ask you this truly and sincerely in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Um, <clears throat> talk about, uh, we were talking about lament a little bit last week in the Psalms of lament and how not many of those show up on um, screensavers and coffee cups. Here's one that doesn't show up very often on t-shirts and stuff either. This is Psalm 137, and it's one of um, a whole different subcategory of psalms that we're going to take a look at. If you were with us last week, as uh, we were in part two of our Summer in the Psalms series, um, the tone of this verse, at least, or this passage, at least a few of the verses may seem, um, I hope, seem um, familiar as they have that tone of lament that we talked about last week where a difficult situation is is cried out about to the Lord. We talked about how that is not just tolerable before the Lord, but He calls us to such prayer. He calls us to experience and savor life that way and to experience it with Him and to pray it like we feel it. But to do it also with some knowledge of who He is and how that all works together. And I would invite you, if you if you weren't here with us, to, to go back and, and listen to that. As Pastor Matt mentioned the week previous, uh, and as we explored even a, a little further last Sunday, um, lament is a very uh, common genre or category of the Psalms. Matter of fact, it's the largest. Most the, the, of, of all the categories, the largest is that of lament that feeling of what life is and it really shouldn't surprise us because the life that we live is in a world that is marred and broken and and not quite right in so many ways but i'm sure that you noticed as we read uh, today's text um some other hues and tones and textures to it that set this psalm apart from even psalm 42 and some of the other laments. It may shock you that even some of those verses are found in our Bible at all. Um, if you're a little more familiar with the scriptures, um, you may identify this psalm as, uh, and, on, and, and the shocking lines included there, um, you may recognize them as being a, a separate category of psalms that we call imprecatory psalms or Psalms that call down justice, in fact, wrath, in fact, curse from God. Um, but as you read this, you may be somebody who's saying, I, I just don't know exactly what to do with these things. So I tend to not read them, or if I read them, I just kind of like fly over 30,000 feet, don't get into the weeds, because I just don't know what to make of such a passage. And you might be one who maybe looks at such lines, and uh, you may take great joy in them saying, outstanding. Standing. Apparently, we have now the permission from God to go ahead and pray that God rain down wrath on somebody that we're not particularly good with at the moment. And the Lord just let it rain camels on him or something. I don't. I, I'm just furious at this guy. He's he's driving me crazy, and I see precedence for it here. So let's go ahead and just pray wrath on people. And 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 I hope to help you a little bit today. If that's you, that's not the purpose here. Um, or you might be. Like some people that I've chatted with regarding um, passages like this, and you may know that we belong now in a, in a new covenant arrangement with God. We are in the, the New Testament. We are enlightened Christians in an age of grace, and we've moved past such dark old thoughts and words. And we look at these passages and we think something akin to, wow, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't live back then. Because those seem like some pretty harsh times. I'm glad that, that somehow God over time has mellowed out some, huh? And that he's not as responsive to sin as he used to be. I'm, we lucked out being born when we were born. I hope, if that's you, that you'll be helped today too. Because that's, that's not the response that God is calling for here. These are words, all of them, that are inspired by God, preserved by God through the ages for us, for our good, for his glory. All of them, even these hard ones. 
This is why I asked us a moment ago to imagine a congregation and a corporate reading of this passage, singing of this passage, perhaps, perhaps, or a family sitting together, mother, father, children, and, and the father takes up this verse, and the mother elbows him and says, no, no, don't, don't read that passage. Don't read that passage. It talks about dashing babies on rocks. And unless we feel, or lest we feel that we should be hiding certain passages from our children or wives or maybe unsaved friends, I, I want to set us free from that and let us know that all of God's word is beneficial to all who he would give an ear to hear it. All of it. All of it. And we just need to know how to handle it rightly. So the question is, beg, what possible good could come from such passages? I mean, really, what practical good, what, what encouragement toward godliness and, and, and love and grace and uh, what does this reveal about God? What, what, what's the reason here? And again, what we pray to achieve is, as we go through all these various psalms is, again, we're not going to go through all 150 psalms this summer. We're, we're going to go, though, I hope, through some of the categories that, um, that will be most helpful to us. And, and I think it'd be helpful if we tackled some of the categories I think that are most difficult for us, lest we, again, avoid them or explain them away some silly way and not get from them what we should. So we're hoping to, to make us, as a body of believers and as individuals and as family units, uh, just a little more skillful with the Psalms so that we can handle these well, see Jesus in them, and, and grow. And, and as I mentioned a minute ago, this is a particular uh, category, a particularly difficult category. Is it's that subcategory that are called imprecatory Psalms. And I said that, that mentions that speaks of a calling down of curse or punishment on another. And you see how, you've seen how we end most every service here, as so many churches do, with uh, a reading of a passage that invokes God's blessing on people, and we call that a benediction prayer, that God would bless and use his people until we gather again. It's a good custom of the church through the years. Uh, this is essentially the opposite. It's a malediction. It's, I am calling upon that same God but to do something that is not even near blessing. And there it is in your Bible and in mine. So um, as we mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of lament psalms, and within those lament songs, Psalms, there are an awful lot of, if we really get down and look closely, of such psalms, these imprecatory psalms, these psalms that call out for the justice of God, just the raw justice of God to be doled out. Psalms like 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 17, 28, 31, and about 25 others. This is not some little obscure subgenre of psalms that, 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 that one would have to dig for. As you read your psalms, if you read your psalms, you'll see there's all these calls for justice. And what do we do with that? When we've been taught that grace means that God doesn't care about sin, well, that's not what grace means at all. And God remains just and holy. And yes, he remains gracious and merciful and forgiving. And how does he reconcile that? Well, he's not as conflicted about that as we are. He is who he is perfectly. There's no contradiction. There's no dichotomy. There's no, there's no tension in God. There's tension in us. And how do we reconcile this loving, caring, merciful God with the God of justice and wrath? Well, it's, it's in these Psalms where we come to meet this other facet of God, which doesn't make him any less loving, any less holy, any less your father and your friend. But we need to know him this way. And to do so, we must be aware of and remember and utilize a few guiding principles when we come to passages like this and handling passages like this. We mentioned a moment ago as we prayed to God that he'd give us the grace to do uh, one overarching principle that we should always remember when we come to passages like this is that we always read the difficult passages in the light of the plain passages. We always read the hard to understand parts in the light of, informed by the clearer parts. And then we can come to some very, very helpful and blessed and fruitful 
interpretations of scripture that are accurate and faithful to God's intention. So first of all, as a guideline here, I want us to to know that we can't just relegate these passages, um, as we said, to an Old Testament world uh, and and feel that such things are foreign to us as, as we enjoy this New Testament relationship with God. That was the old angry God. And and there are those theologians who would teach you that today. That there was some kind of a shift that happened in God, uh, in his very nature, that made him far more lenient on sin, less concerned about holiness. And do we understand what that does to God? To take God and to remake him entirely and say, he's the God who looks at your sin and sweeps it under the proverbial rug, never again to look at it. Do you understand what that says? The denigration to God's character that that is? Do you realize the besmirching of his glories that that is? To say that God is really not that concerned about sin, so he must not all be so altogether holy. And so you know what? He's suddenly not so worthy of my song anymore. But he's just good enough to get you into the back door of heaven. That is another God altogether, not the God of the scriptures. There are many New Testament passages. For all the New Testament saints who think this has nothing to do with us, there are many New Testament passages where such imprecatory, strong, judgmental language is found in New Testament passages. Several of these imprecations are are put forth by Jesus himself. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day than it will be for you. Because if I had done the miracles that I did in you, in them, they would have repented. I did miracles among you, and you did not repent. There is judgment coming. And the loving Jesus painted on black velvet in your office, here he is speaking words of imprecation. Same Jesus. Same holiness. And you know, what's interesting is that several of the imprecations, several of the calling down of judgment episodes in the New Testament, they quote the imprecations of the Old Testament because God does not change. So thinking it through, if we think it through, those of us who say, well, I don't like such things. I, I don't think that has anything to do with us. If we think it through, even Jesus' teaching of How to pray. After this manner, you should pray, he says. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Do you realize what we're saying when we say that? There is inherent there an imprecation. There is inherent there a call for judgment. For when his kingdom fully comes, he will come in glory and majesty to take his bride to himself. But he will also come in power and in might to dole out judgment upon all those who have rejected him. So when you pray your kingdom come, you're also praying, Lord, come, come, come love your bride and judge your enemies. There's an imprecation in the Lord's prayer. We call for justice. We ought to call for justice. Amidst all our cries for mercy, amidst the right prayers that we make, like prayers that we made this morning in our morning prayer before we started singing, where we prayed for our unsaved family members, absolutely, there is nothing incongruent with praying for, Lord, save those who are not yet your own, Father, please, and at the same time saying, come, Lord Jesus, and rectify the the, the imbalances and the injustices in this world. I'm tired of hearing about the trafficking of children. I'm tired of hearing about slavery. I'm tired of hearing about abuse. I'm tired. I want you to come and rectify that. And I also want you to have mercy on those who are committing such things. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not either or. It's both hand. Because we, in this New Testament, we are the heirs of the Old Testament ethics. That's why we don't just hand out New Testaments. For a little while we did. Remember, we would try and save some money. And we'd hand out New Testaments to folks. And suddenly it dawns on us in a meeting one day, why are we doing that? 
what are we teaching people by doing that? We're teaching them that the Old Testament doesn't have anything to do with us, and we're a New Testament church, and we could just, we say, no, 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 by no means. We, we, we only know the richness of the New Testament by having the Old Testament, and we can only look back into the Old Testament through the, the grace that we found in the, in the New Testament. And so, and so we said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And we are a people who serve a God who is the God of two Testaments. And we, we've inherited those Old Testament ethics. As a matter of fact, Lord willing, we're going to be spending several weeks beginning in the fall on the, on the law in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, we are. Yes, yes. And in 2019, because it still matters deeply. And we don't just ignore these passages or look at them as irrelevant antiquities in some museum of biblical trivia. Stuff matters to us here and now. And furthermore, these imprecations, this invoking, this calling down of curse and judgment, when you see it in Scripture, it only occurs after prolonged, gracious calls of God to repentance. He calls, he warns, he sends prophets, he sends apostles, he sends people to go and call people, come out, repent, turn from your idolatry, the idolatry turn to the one true and living God. And, or if you don't, Judgment will come. And he's true, and he's proven true to every bit of that. So it's not some graceless God of the Old Testament that we've traded in for the gracious God of the New Testament. Many of these imprecations that are, are presented in the Psalms, we have to look at through different eyes as well, because they are many of the imprecations are given from the standpoint of king. King. The, many of them are given by David. Many are given as a representation of the king. And the king speaks not as some angry person who's just gotten sideways with somebody who cut him off in traffic or, or didn't requite their love. Or, or, or No, no, no. It's, it's, it's a king who is speaking judicially. He is speaking from a place of government. And so he speaks with the authority and the responsibility to make sure that there is justice in the kingdom. This is not just some tit for tat fighting between people and calling down God's wrath on somebody. It is a king calling out for justice in the kingdom that the name of God would be held in high regard. And so we can't read them for our own vengeful purposes. Because remember, even in the Old Testament, that kind of personal vengeance, it's, it's forbidden. And we must also remember that many of these curses or these imprecations that we find in the psalm are found in the psalms. And the psalms are high poetry. And so words are spoken with a kind of a poetic hyperbole, with a kind of force and a, a kind of a kind of uh, memorable language that would that would leave a mark on the reader. It's an enhanced kind of an imagery. It's poetry, and so we don't read it the same way as we would read some other piece of literature. And finally, I think uh, amongst the many helpful principles that we can use in, in reading these passages. I think probably most applicable to, to the passage that we're reading today, there stands the principle that these imprecations, these, these calls for the punishment of the wicked, it's merely an inspired prayer to God for the things that God has already promised he was going to do. It's not that the psalmist gets this idea I got this idea. Lord, you should curse them. No, when he makes this prayer, he is standing upon the already established prophecy that God had already sent through another prophet. And he stands on that prophecy and says, Lord, I am praying. Remember your promise. Remember that you are a just God. Remember that this injustice is going on. And I'm standing on the promise that you said you are going to deal with this injustice. So he's already, he's praying for what God has already promised to do. It's not something that the psalmist came up with on his own in a fit of rage. I think that's, I pray that's helpful to us as we look at these things. In fact, in our passage today, we're going to see that the psalmist is standing on these, these ancient prophecies that, that we have in our Bible that we can look at and, and see why he prays what he prays. And as with any passage of Scripture, the context is crucial. 
Instead of taking a passage and ripping it, kicking and screaming out of what God intended and making it say what we want, we hold it right where it is and we see that God divinely placed it where he placed it in the Word, in the word and so we read it that way. And some, some psalms, as, as we read them, are a little more vague in their setting. We don't know sometimes in these psalms who exactly wrote it. The author is not given. We don't know the exact circumstance. And it really is a grace of God that they're written sometimes in very vague and all-encompassing kind of language. That he, doesn't, he doesn't use particular names of places and circumstances and, and name the details of a situation that precisely. So that way it fits us all pretty well. It's not just a psalm for this particular circumstance that would never be a blessing to my life. No, no, he, he, he writes them in such a way. But then there's psalms like this, where we get an address, where we get a phone number, where we get, I mean, we just know exactly what's happening here. And as we read it and we look at the background of it, I think it helps us to see a progression, even in this psalm, that makes a difference to us today. As we walk through the phases of this psalmist's inspired cry, to God, we're going to see, I think, at least three different phases of his walk. We see first some anguish. Yeah, this is a lament. We see some anguish in his heart. And then we see that anguish turn quickly to a resolve. There's a, there's a commitment that's made. There's a decision that's made. Starts weeping, and the weeping leads to a, a, a firm standing upon something, a decision that's made. And then there is this proclamation of a confidence in God. Starts with lament, moves to a resolve, and then it goes to a, a strong and declared confidence in God and His promises. I'd say that's not a bad pattern, huh? I think it's a familiar pattern to some of us, to go from that place of brokenness before God, to be able to stand and say, yes, I will honor him and recommit my life to him, and then to go forth proclaiming he is a faithful, promise-keeping God. So first, let's hear his anguish. We read it there in the first three verses. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our lyres. From there, excuse me, for there our captors required of us songs. And our tormentors mirth, saying, sing to us one of the songs of Zion. And while our, our eyes and our hearts still may be hung up on the last verses where this harsh language is stated, I want to invite us to not forget that while the people of God are singing this psalm through the centuries and they're crying out for God's judgment, the people of Israel were a people well acquainted with God's judgment, for they had been on the other end of it. The people of God knew a great deal about the judgment of God, the justice of God, because they had received the business end of God's justice on various occasions. They knew that when God said, be faithful to me, lest I bring punishment on you, they knew firsthand, experientially, nobody had to tell them, they knew God keeps his promises. And that's exactly the circumstance they find themselves in here. God is willing to dole out his justice, his judgment, even upon his chosen people, not for condemnation, but for the chastisement of his loving children to draw them near to him again. And you know what? I'm preaching to the choir even here. Some of us know what it's like to step out of God's will and to take it in our own direction and to feel the loving reprimand of God. And their pain had to do with Place. It included the fact that they were not home. Where they were and where they no longer were was a source of great lament to them. They're in Babylon, it says. And the Jews are not in the promised land. They're in another place. The Jews are not inhabiting and flourishing in the land that God had promised and miraculously brought them to through all those miles and miracles and plagues and everything else, cloud by day, fire by night, all that. It brings them to a place and suddenly they can't be there anymore. 430 years in Egypt. 
They sang of a flickering hope of a place, a time, a relationship with a God. Suddenly Moses comes and through miracle and might, God brings him into a place. Suddenly you can't be there anymore. Because all that I warned you not to do, you did. I told you, go in, conquer, displace them completely. Do not look upon their gods. Do not lust after what they have because I've given you something better. But upon getting there, all they wanted was what everybody else had. I was reading through Chronicles this week and it just dawned on me. And I couldn't get up on a high perch of self-righteousness because it sounds very familiar even in my life. Or you see the people of God come in and conquer another people by the grace and the might of God. While these people are calling out on their God, save us from these Jews, save us from these Israelites. Look, here they come and they conquer us. So they cried out to their gods and their gods made of stone, made of wood, who have ears that can't hear and eyes that can't see. They did not respond because they could not respond. These people were vanquished, plundered. And amidst the plunder, they took they're gods. And the Israelites said, maybe we should worship these gods. Gods that did not help those who served them. Well, that's exactly what happened. And prophet came and prophet went. Prophets were sent and prophets were stoned. Prophets were sent and prophets were ignored. And God says, time now. It's time now that you see that I'm not a God to be trifled with. My promises are true. My love for you is true. While we have, been, we have come into this covenant relationship, I will be true even when you are not. And for the sake of my promises, my covenant love, my promises to seat one on the throne of David forevermore, God's still taking along view. He says, I I'm going I'm to have to move you out for a while. And it was violent and it was harsh. And now they find themselves in the captivity of Babylon. All due to stubbornness, all due to turning from the one true God. And here we see the people of God remembering the past, looking back. We remembered Zion, says the psalmist. We remembered Zion, that beautiful mountaintop, that place where the city of David, the, the city of Jerusalem, where the temple was. And in the temple was a place, the dwelling place of God. Not that he was limited to that place, but it was a place where God would manifest, manifest himself particularly. And he would, an atonement was made for sin. And there was all of this presence and this, this, this communion with the one true living God. And it's concentrated in this one geographical place. It's this beautiful place that we are left only to to remember because we can't be there anymore. Hence the lament. You've been far from home longer than you want to be. Once Zion was theirs to enjoy. It, it was the envy of every surrounding nation, but now they're left only to remember it as they sit around the canals of Babylon. Scripture tells us the horrible details of how Jerusalem fell. They were besieged, and then in the 6th century B.C., the Babylonians breached the wall, come in and take them, and took them with incredible violence. Atrocities were committed. It was brutality of the worst sort. And those who were not brutally murdered or left to grow crops for their captors were dragged off into captivity, just as God had promised. Israelites knew firsthand, and they knew quite lamentably, that God keeps his promises to judge wickedness, even amongst his own people. As the New Testament testifies, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And aside from the atrocities that were committed against the Israelites, when, when the Babylonians captured them, the psalmist writes of ongoing cruelty. He says, now, now we lost all that. All we can do is remember it. 
We, it, there's nobody we know who hasn't lost a loved one in all of this. We're dragged far from home. We're sitting here by the canals, by the, by the waterways that, 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 that water the, the crops of our enemies and keep them so powerful here. We are, and on top of everything else, our captors, and he calls them our tormentors, demand of us song. Go ahead, sing. And, you know, somebody might ask, you know, well, well how, much, how much harm could it possibly do to sing? I mean, it, it might even do him some good to have a little sing along, right? Just to, guys, pick it up and, and sing. Let's just remember old times. Their captors, their tormentors only asked them to sing because they knew that such songs existed. These were a people famous for their worship. And they worshiped differently than the other nations because their God was not like their God. They worshiped in a way more passionately because their God was greater than the other gods. They sang with an excellence that exceeded the worship of the other nations because their one God exceeded all of their gods put together. And they were famous for their worship. And so once they had them all there, they said, hey, why don't you sing some of those songs you were so famous for? They only sang the songs that they sang, and they only sang them the way that they sang them because their God so inspired them to sing. And let me pause and say, nobody, nobody should sing more passionately than the people of God. No one. Something happens to me when I turn on TV and I'll see like concert footage. For whoever the flavor of the month is right now. And crowds amassing and singing and shouting and hands up and going home hoarse and having to have paramedics there. I'm not talking about not calling for disorder in the church, but something of passion. Because the God we sing to far exceeds the glory of some boy band. I don't think the Psalms, here's a little side free sermon. I don't think the Psalms teaches that there's anything particularly reverent and pleasing to God when we sing handcuffed in stained glass voices before him. I recommend that we sing to God the way he deserves. Oh, that we would become famous for such singing and with such praise make him famous. But it seemed an impossibility to them in their circumstances. We can't, we can't sing that way. How? How shall we sing when we're in a strange land? They'd learned as we repeatedly have to. Now that they didn't have Zion, that they didn't have the temple, that they didn't have the worship, that they didn't have the high feast days, the high holy days, that they didn't have tabernacle booths and, and the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles where they have all the booths there and they didn't have the various new moons and s- just, just a celebration. It seemed like the Jews were looking for a reason to celebrate God. Suddenly it's gone. And when it's gone, then we appreciate things, huh? Oh, it was so great. But yet when it was yours to freely do, you chose to worship stone and wood. Yeah, there, there's something worth lamenting here. And now that's all there is, is lament. But the psalm begins to show a movement here. And it's a movement in the right direction as the the Israelites here begin to see some things and have a right response to the situation. And that is to, to learn, to grow, to be resolute, to, to, to resolve, to not give in any further to the pressures the way they had in the past. It shows up here in in a commitment they make, a determination to cherish what they once counted so cheap. And that was their special relationship with the Lord. I want us to hear the resolve now. We've heard the lament. Now, Now hear the resolve that's birthed from that lament. Now that they're saying we can only look 
back at Zion. We can only look back at our relationship. It's not here anymore. We're not there anymore. And now they say, what can we do with this? We can just, we can just dry up and shrivel and die as a people, or we can have a new resolve. Look at what verse 4 says. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill and my tongue let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if i do not remember you if i do not set jerusalem above my highest joy we actually begin to get the first hints at a new resolve at a at a at a, at a holy kind of stubbornness beginning to set in all the way back in verse 2 where they said we hung up our lyres you want us to sing they're hanging on the willow trees we sing for one we sing at the behest of one who is worthy. Not because you want to put us out at some kind of a carnival show and you want to hear the doleful songs that we used to sing, sung now with defeat in our voices. No, no more. We hung them up. We only sing for him. And we only sing because we're in right relationship with him. And right now, we're having trouble with that. And so there's, there's no reason for song. But I'm so glad that they didn't take those lyres and harps and everything else and just destroy them. Because a song could still be sung if they would turn to him. We saw the people suffering under the divine judgment of God in these opening verses. And then we see them calling down the judgment of God upon their enemies in the closing verses. But when we look at those closing verses, we say, well, those are clearly imprecations. They're calling down judgment upon their enemies. But before they called down judgment on their enemies, they had, number one, felt the judgment of God that had led them into captivity. And then in verses 5 and 6, six you see them calling down more judgment. This time, it's not on their enemies. They're calling down judgment on themselves. Look at verses 5 and 6. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. Those are not good things. These are the worst kind of curses for musicians. Let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. No more song, no more instrument, no more anything. Let me stop being who I am if I forget you, O Jerusalem. What grace, what progress. This is again from a people who had once said, forget the living God, we'll serve the Ashtoreth, we'll serve Moloch, we'll serve all of these lesser gods. No, now they're saying, I have no song for anyone else. And if I forget Jerusalem, if Jerusalem is not at least always a memory in my heart, may I just stop being who I am. They're calling down curse. If I forget, let curse fall on me. If I forget, let judgment fall on me. If I forget how good God was to me, and there's a new resolution in their mind. They say, we stand for one only. We sing for one only. And may we so learn. May we so learn even now how to process the chastisement of our loving God when he does, when he does, because he does. And the scripture says he does chastise the son whom he loves. And when chastisement come, comes our way, let it not drive us into bitterness. Yeah, you have to go through lament. Yes, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn the sin. Turn from the sin. But let it drive us to a new resolve. I will not go there again. May we lament and repent and then move on to, to, to resolve, to cherish the precious things of God like we never did before. And unless we count this as something less than it is, I want us to know that when they say we remember Jerusalem, we long for Jerusalem, we want to be back in Zion, this is not just patriotism, okay? This is not just some mere nationalism. Oh, we miss our home turf. No, no, there's more to it. It's not about the rock where the city was set. It's not about the buildings or the walls. It's not even about the temple. It's about the special, particular, intimate relationship that they had with God. God that was tied to the land that he had promised them. When they say we miss Zion, we miss everything about Zion, the walk with God, the singing and the throng of saints who lifted up God together. That's what we miss is the relationship with God. It's not just patriotism. They long for that special intimacy. And now seeing through, through tear-filled eyes, but with a much clearer perspective, 
the resolve to never trade the greater joys again for the lesser joys, the lesser passing, fleeting pleasures of this world. They said, no, we won't do that again. And in the midst of lament, and then this new resolve, psalmist, now in representation of all the people of God, he remembers not only the painful past, but he remembers that there's promises of the future. The psalmist says, it's true. It, it, it's, it's, it's an irrefutable fact that we did what we did and God responded how we responded and we are who, where we are and we're not where we used to be. That is true. But it is equally true that our God has made some promises and we are standing on those things regarding our future as well. And here begins now. This confidence in God's promise-keeping grace. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall be Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. First of all, we need to notice that the judgment that he speaks of doesn't come at his own hands. He doesn't say, Lord, if you just let me lay my hands on them. Lord, if you would just empower me to just rip these people shred. If you would just, just enable me to, to raise up an army, a rebellion, and we would, we would take them. No, Lord, I put it in your hands. For that's where vengeance is to be put. Somebody limped into this service and limps everywhere else that you go because of some anger, some hatred perhaps that you have against someone else, some desire to see justice doled out on that person and you struggle because you so want vengeance but you want it to come at your hands. It would be so much sweeter if you could somehow play a part. But here the psalmist says, remember, O Lord, it's you. All this is in your hands. They did us wrong. We suffered at their hands, but we know ultimately who this came from. And we know ultimately that you are the one that doles out justice. And so we leave it in your hands. And while the judgment that had fallen on Jerusalem in that sixth century BC, it was from God. Ultimately, it was God's faithful response to their unfaithfulness to him. But here's God. Mystery of mysteries. Same God who is ultimately responsible for the judgment that befell them. God still promised to hold the nations responsible for the hate and cruelty which, with which they tormented his people. He says, I'm behind all this, but the hatred with which the Babylonians come against you, I will respond to that as well. Here it is, God, ultimate in his sovereignty and yet balancing it with the responsibility of men. Sovereign, causal, in fact, for all of the affairs of man, provident in all of his actions, owning everything, not one maverick molecule in the universe. And yet he says, those instruments that I used, I will judge them for the hate with which they came against you. Harkening back to those words of Joseph in Genesis. I know, brothers of mine, I know, I know. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. We see that as an either-or situation. It's the mind that trusts God that says, here is God. Mysterious in his dealings, wise beyond anything I can ever imagine, and he is a God who is causal, orchestrating everything in the universe, and yet, holding man responsible in his actions. Blessed be the Lord. And that's where my explanation ends because that's where the Bible's explanation ends. And that's all we need to know to worship and trust him. And if we think we need some kind of prima donna explanation before we let him be God, we need to take a big step back. And while the judgment that had fallen on them was from God, he says, the vessels I used will pay for the hatred that they inflicted on you. So, so here's the sovereign God at work. And psalmist begins with the Edomites. 
Edomites. Remember the Edomites, Lord. What he's saying is, remember the promise you made regarding the Edomites. This is not his idea. He says, hey, Lord, I got this idea. Let's come against the Edomites. No, he's only standing on the things that God had already promised to do. He says, bring about, Lord, what you promised to do, and you promised to do something about the Edomites. The Edomites were, were those descendants of Esau. You say, what do they have to do with this? They're in Babylon. I can understand them being upset at the Babylonians, but at the time that the Babylonians besieged and captured Jerusalem, there were a people not far off, the Edomites, who were kin of theirs. The descendants of Esau, brother of Jacob, there's a blood relationship there. And while they didn't come and attack Jerusalem, when the Babylonians did attack Jerusalem, they cheered them on and said, raise the place, knock it down, every stone, raise it to the ground. Matter of fact, the scriptures tell us that those people in Jerusalem who escaped the Edomites captured them and turned them over to the Babylonians, rejoiced in the calamity of their kin. And here the psalmist says, remember, Lord, you saw it. And you promised to deal with that injustice. God had not missed this. And he promised a response. And it's this fulfillment of this prophecy and this vindication of, of a prophetic word that the psalmist is crying out for here. I, I, I invite you to go home and read, read the prophet Obadiah. And he, he speaks about this. To see here that the psalmist is remembering the future. I'm remembering that God said in times past what he'll do in times future. And that's what his imprecation is standing on. It's not just some, some, some hatred, some vengeance in his heart. He's calling for God to make things right, lest God be proven a liar. He's standing in, 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 the, in, in, in a passionate plea that God's name and reputation be preserved. And not just that some angry vengeance be taken. By verse 8, the psalmist does not speak of Babylon, if you'll notice, but he speaks to Babylon. It gets real, real straight here and real personal. You think, is this because he's so angry? Verse eight, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed shall be, shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. He didn't speak of them. He speaks directly to Babylon. There's a reason for this. First of all, referring to daughter of Babylon, referring to a city as a virgin girl was the way it was very common Hebraism. It's, it's how they re referred to cities. But when he, he speaks directly in the first person to Babylon, he's drawing a parallel here. And it's a parallel with what he had done in verse 5. He's making, we, we kind of lose it in the English translation, but he's making a parallel here. And he, in verse 5, he spoke directly to the city of Jerusalem. If I forget you, oh, Jerusalem. Speaks directly to Jerusalem, uh, personifies Jerusalem as this, as this city, that, uh, this person, this bride that he speaks to. And then he speaks to Babylon. Oh, daughter of Babylon. What he's doing is drawing a parallel between the city of God and the city of men. About the kingdom of God and all that God has done to make relationship right with man. And he speaks to, to Babylon as all that man has done to reject and rebel against God. And you only have to look so far as the book of Revelations, chapter 14 and 16 and 17 and 18 again to see that in so many prophecies, God's judgment on Babylon extends out to everyone who would ever attack his people. They're included in Babylon as well. And like so many prophecies in Scripture, there's, there's multiple layers. There's layers of the fulfillment of that. He says, Babylon, you're going to be laid low, Babylon. And the actual city of Babylon was laid low. That city-state was brought low. They were conquered later. But that's not the end of that prophecy because he speaks now to, to oh, Babylon, the world order that has come against all things holy and righteous. He says, your judgment is coming as well. And likewise, he speaks to Jerusalem again in the book of Revelation. And I saw Jerusalem descending like a bride. Oh, there it is again, the parallel. City of God, city of man. But he says here, how Babylon was the means by which the Lord judged and led his people into captivity. And through captivity, led his people to repentance. 
Babylonian cruelty was not going to go unpunished because God promised so. You see how the psalmist, he's only standing upon the sure promises of God. This is not just his vengeance. I hope that relieves some of the tension when you read these things. Blessed is he who dashes your little ones against the stone. Wow, that psalmist was angry. What a mean guy. No, what a biblically informed guy. What faith he has. What, what, what a sure foundation he stands on when he says, God said he'll do it, and I know he'll do it, and I'm just making a biblical prayer. I'm praying along lines with God's revealed will. I want what you said you would do. Oh, we'd be blessed if we prayed a little more biblically. We'd see a lot more responses to our prayers if we prayed what the Bible promised. But notice what he says here. As he stands on this promise. Verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Where does he get this doom from? From the prophecies of Scripture. When he reads in places like the book of Isaiah and he reads in Jeremiah that the Lord has intentions upon, designs upon Babylon. I'm going to bring judgment on you for the hatred with which you came against Israel. And we know that there was a particular atrocity to what they did that led the psalmist to write these things and to stand knowing that God was going to, to level the playing field and, and bring things right and make things just. Because in verse 9 where he says, Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. It's clear. I think we can all, we can all agree. But that's the most shocking verse in the passage, right? That's, that's the one that seems like at least fits in your Bible and concept of Jesus. And okay. Blessed. That's the same word, blessed, that began the first psalm that we learned about two weeks ago. Psalm 1 1 begins what? Blessed is the man who walks not in the council. Blessed means happy. Blessed is the man who walks not in the council of the ungodly. And also, blessed is he who dashes your little ones against the rock. How, how, how do we reconcile these things? It makes perfect sense because in, in Psalm 1, as we mentioned before, Psalm 1 begins setting the tone for the rest of the Psalter, and he lays out two paths, a decision that needs to be made. Those who will walk in the counsel of the ungodly, those who will sit in the seat of the scorners, those who will, who will sit in the seat of mockers. And then he says, and then over here, there's, there's those who are like a tree planted by waters. There's a choice that's made. There's the blessed life. Those who will follow God, those who will be used of God. And here he says, blessed is, shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Well, where do you come up with this, man? I mean, is this guy just that hateful that he's that creative in his anger? You know what would be really mean? If we took their little ones, Lord. No, he's not coming up with this out of the blue. And we know that just by what it says in verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. That's what had happened in Israel when the Babylonians breached the wall, came in. They, they tore open the women. They killed their little ones. They dashed them against the stones. And here he says, God knows how to make things right. And I'm calling on you, God, to make things right. Because while you are loving and kind and gracious and merciful, you're just and holy and not to be trifled with, and your promises stand sure. And so he's making a prayer aligned with what God had prophetically made known. And it's true. And that's how the psalm ends, period. You, you almost want to say, oh man, I hope some scholar finds some fragment somewhere of some missing verse that ends that up and says, but God was just kidding. Or God, he's a lot nicer than all that, and he repented of having ever made that prophecy come about through the, no. It just ends right there. And again, remember, this gets sung by families. This gets read in our homes. To the comfort of our souls, the building of our faith. How? Well, it's like we listen to a piece of music. When we listen to a selection of music, we don't remember it by the final note that is played. We remember it by the whole body of work, right? We remember it by, by all the chords and everything that goes into it, the entirety of the piece. And true, there is ultimate justice coming, but what are we to do as we wait? Because as we said, God does not change. 
And what are we to do as we know that ultimate justice is coming? Well, we're to do as the prophet Jeremiah said to these very people. Because the psalmist writes of a time when they were in Babylon, but at that same time, God had moved prophets to write to the exiles that were in Babylon and tell them, so, so what are you supposed to do while you're there? Let me tell you what you're supposed to do while you're there. And in Jeremiah 29, he says, you are to multiply, do not decrease in numbers. And he says, and you are to work for the, the, the well-being, the welfare of that city, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Don't sit there, don't stagnate, don't suck your thumb and lament and get into the fetal position. I understand you're exiles, but there's a way to live in exile. You're to be fruitful. You're to work for the greater good. Justice is coming. Yes, it's coming for sure. The Babylonians did not get away with this. Justice is coming. It's imminent. But in the interim, there's a way you're supposed to live. And so must we. And now in Christ, as we are in exile as well in so many ways, as Peter writes, we are the elect exiles of God. And we're in a place that's not home. We're not going to be here long. And how do we live herein? Well, we must do the same. We must multiply and do good by the gospel of his grace. We know that the judgment is coming. And we're to spend our time doing the greatest good of all. And that's reaching out with the saving message of Jesus Christ. Helping people to escape the wrath to come. Prophet Jeremiah told them that they, they must not just survive, but multiply. Come out of your captivity bigger than you were when you went in. He's telling them, don't decrease in number. You need to have children while you're in exile. And so the family of God grows. It grows as believers become the children of God through the loving proclamation of the gospel, that gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that says that Jesus came to bear all the judgment that would come to those, all the judgment that would otherwise come to those who believed in him. God remains just, friends. He's He's still a God of justice. Sin is always punished. I'm going to say that again. Sin is always punished. I, I can already feel it going cross grain against some of your notions of grace. Sin always goes punished. But for those who trust in Jesus and trust him to be the son of God, and the sufficient and perfect sacrifice for our sin, the penalty of your sin was doled out on him. Your sin did not disappear, did not vaporize. It was concentrated and poured out on one man, on one hill, on one Friday afternoon. All of the judgment for all of your sins, past, present, and future, the sins of a billion people for a billion years are just, just there poured out on him. Justice satisfied. God keeps his word. Holiness intact. His threats vindicated. But when it's all over, the cup of his wrath is emptied to its dregs to the last drop on him that there's nothing left for you and me and there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That ought to move us even in our exile. There's a judgment coming. And that ought to move us with an urgency to let people know the justice is satisfied in Christ. Come to Him. Your sin credited to Him, His righteousness credited to you. You received into the family of God. Is this not good news? And then we learn from the overall movement of this psalm. And there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But there is definitely the loving chastisement of a father. He did not give up on the Israelites. 
He does not give up on you. His covenant love is an unbreakable covenant. He sets his affections upon you never to lift them again. Jesus said, none that the Father gives me will ever be taken. You can't snatch them from my hand. They're eternally mine, and you are eternally his. But because you are eternally his, the proof that we are eternally his is that he lovingly chastises and forms us, and he deals with us sometimes very strongly. And perhaps you're right now feeling the painful love of God calling you back to him, and he's calling you through hardship. He's calling you through suffering. Respond humbly. And respond with the resolve shown in this psalm. Determine and resolve that your greatest joy and your sweetest songs are preserved for God. The God who showed you his love in Christ. Do not share your affections. Do not dither or loiter in sin and pain. Do not trifle with God. Do not play with his grace. Commit afresh to the one who is forever committed to you. And then go ahead, remember. We do well to remember. As Jesus says to the church is in the book of Revelation. Remember to where, from where you have fallen. Remember how you once loved him? You remember? Remember how nothing was as important? Remember? Remember when it was, just, it was everything? Remember? Remember the better days of your commitment. But while you're remembering that, remember his sure promises for the future. Promises of unrivaled, unalloyed, pure pleasure and joy and bliss in the presence of God. Promises, sure promises of judgment upon all those who counted him unworthy of your little life. For those are sure. Remember the past. Remember the future. Jesus will return in glory. He will judge the rebellious and he will take his beloved children home forever. And let this sure return move you to faithfulness. To love him, to love his beloved people, to have compassion on those who will receive the full force of his judgment unless they turn to him. Proclaim salvation. Proclaim it. In this life. We proclaim it. We proclaim it today. We proclaim it in a multiplicity of ways. We proclaim Christ and his salvation by word and by deed. I I pray that you saw the joy of salvation and heard the message of salvation as we sang today. Because that's what we sing about. And I pray that you heard the call of a holy, loving God in his word preached today. And I pray that you'll observe the love of God, the gospel of God, the saving message of Jesus Christ as we partake of a simple communal meal today. I pray that you'll observe that in our partaking of this tiny piece of bread, ridiculously small cup, How we, by his word and by his enlightening of our hearts, we can attach the appropriate meaning and weight and receive this simple meal as a means of grace by which we are reminded, yes, of the past and the future. In the simple cup and in the simple bread that we're about to partake of, I want to invite you to do exactly this what we've been talking about today. Remember the past and remember the future. Remember that Jesus did historically really come to earth, live and die and rise again. But remember the future as well. He is coming again. That's what this cup means. That's what this bread means. Let me tell you what it's not before we partake in the usher service in a moment. This is not mass. 
If you're a Roman Catholic friend and you're here today, this is not Mass. We do not crucify him afresh. We do not do this in any way to gain the merits, the points, the favor of God. We do this as our response to the full portion of his grace that he's already given us. And we do it according to scripture. We do it in remembrance of him because we are, forget, we are forgetful hearts. And like baptism, this is not for small children. For those who consciously turn from sin to Jesus in everything. So if you're a believer, perhaps of, a, of another Bible-believing congregation, please do join us. Join us in this communion meal because it's, it's communion with God and with all the saints. We take it together. But if you've not believed, if your faith doesn't look like what we've talked about today, first of all, I would tell you with urgency, Having looked at God and all his love and all his judgment, before we talk about bread and wine, I would beg you, I would beseech you with all that I have, turn to Jesus today. But if you feel like this is not your faith and this is not where you are right now, I would ask you to just observe. Just observe. Just observe how something so exceedingly simple can mean so much. So I ask the ushers to uh, prepare to serve the elements. I'll ask the, the band to make their way forward. And I want to read to you a, a passage. In Matthew 26 Verses 26 through 29, we'll read through it a couple of times, but it's on the night that Jesus was together with his disciples. And he in a moment takes the Passover meal and makes of it the communion meal that we celebrate today. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is, my, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I invite you to pray with me, and then as the band plays, the ushers will serve the elements. Father, you call upon us to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, to examine our hearts in moments like this.